Uh, so, I'm Brian, and uh, I work on the AngularJS core team at Google. And uh, thank you. Um, All right, all right, all right. I'm flattered, all right, I'm, I'm flattered. Uh, but before we get started, I have, I have just one thing to do here. There we go. I haven't pushed any code, and I want my like GitHub graph to be nice. I have to push this upstream, too. Yes, there we go, all right. See, look at that, I'm a really responsible person. Um, all right, and then one last other order of business. I have to tweet. <laughs> and then you also, you gotta get your retweets in too, so. We're doing. <laughs> all right, all right, we're, now we're really ready to go. So like I said, I'm Brian. I'm the social media expert on Angular. Um, <laughs> and I'm gonna be talking about zones. Um, this is the the enigmatic talk that uh, my colleagues have been alluding to. Um, so it's totally overhyped, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to be disappointed, but uh, <laughs> bear with me. OK, so, so uh, what is Zone.js? Um, if any of you are familiar with, uh, with Node, it's, it's actually kind of like domains in there. It's kind of like it. You know, just get a, an idea in your head. Um, if you've used Java, it's, it's kind of like thread locals in Java. Uh, the, the implications are a little bit different, but just to, to prime your brain. Um, and it's also in Dart. I know Dart has a lot of haters, but it's in Dart, and it's a, it's a good feature. And so Zone.js is a port of this awesome Dart feature to JavaScript. And this is just one of the many ways that Dart is actually like helping us on the JS side. Um, but, but according to Mishko, this, this was uh, a, an excellent quote by him when I was uh, going over slides. He said, it's like open heart surgery on the web browser. And uh, the reason is that the implementation is, is kind of crazy. Uh, we won't worry about that too much in here, but um, hopefully you'll, you'll see that you have to do some powerful stuff in order to get this kind of feature. All right, so what is a zone? All right, you ready, guys? The big reveal, it's an execution context. Talk over, right? Yeah, all right. So what, what, what on earth do I mean by something nebulous like this? Um, it, it really only makes sense if, if we like, take a step back and we go back to like, JavaScript 101 and we think about how JavaScript is asynchronous and, and how this kind of works. Um, so here's, here's some code on the left, um, very interesting code. Uh, it's, you know, we're, we're, we're calling set timeout. We're, we're running some functions that do some arbitrary things. But really what I want to think about is the, the order that these things happen, right? So we, we know what, uh, what this will do, but let's, let's step through it, right? So A will be invoked. We'll have set timeout on B. So B gets added to this queue. And this is a task that will be run later. Um, and so if, if you know how like the, the event loop in the browser works, you know that as soon as we're done here, these things that we're queuing up, B and C, will run after we've reached the end of this task on the left, this block of synchronous code, right? So now B and then C, right? Okay, yeah, super cool. Brian just taught us JavaScript, awesome. Um, but the, the, the implications of this are, like, are really important. So what if, for instance, we wanted to time how long, time the, the, the CPU time, I guess, of of something like this. We can't just start a timer at the beginning and stop it at the end um, because the, the asynchronous uh, B and C will, will be missed. Like, we won't capture them. We won't see them. Um, and so this is a, a convenient segue into sort of how Zone.js could help us. So what if at the beginning and end of each of these tasks, like, we could have a hook that somehow let us maybe start and stop this timer? If, if we could do this, we could keep track of it, right? And actually, that's, that's exactly what Zone.js does. So let's, let's see what this code would look like here. So we, would, uh, we have to define these sort of hooks. Um, and then we actually just take this code and we run it inside of, of the zone. Um, pretty simple, right? Yeah. Um, so what is actually, what's, what's happening here, though? Um, the async tasks run in the same zone that they were registered. So because we're, we're, we have set timeout on B and C, they also inherit this, the, these special properties, these special hooks uh, that we've defined on the right-hand side, right? 
And so when I, when I say that these tasks are registered, I mean things like set timeout, add event listener, anything that, will, that could cause some asynchronous task uh, to, to, to be added to that queue sometime in the future. Right. And the other important thing is that this is, it's transitive, right? So uh, we're at the bottom there. This is, perhaps I put this in a bad order, but uh, we, we first run this first function. It queues up the second function. The second function runs, it queues up the third. They're all still in the zone. They all still uh, have these same properties. Um, and so this still seems like really abstract, but I like to think of Zone.js as like a meta monkey patch. It gives you this kind of low-level foundation that lets you instrument the browser and, and know about when these tasks end. And it lets you follow along this asynchronous control flow that normally you, you wouldn't be able to, uh, to, to observe. Um, and then the other interesting thing is that you can use this to compose behaviors. So Zone API, as you'll see shortly, actually lets you combine together a bunch of different functionality um, to, to do all sorts of crazy things. All right, so what are the actual practical applications? Why are, like, why are you talking about this, Brian? So there, there are some really interesting things that you can do if you have a tool like this as far as debugging and testing and profiling and maybe even some other crazy stuff that, that hopefully you guys come up with uh, after this talk, because you guys are smart. Okay, so let's, let's demo this. This makes a lot more sense, I think, if you actually just look at the code. So here I have a, a really boring application. Um, there's two buttons, one that says bind error and the other one that says cause error. We have a main method that sets up a, a listener on this first button, right? And what happens is it calls this function that sets up a listener on the second button. And that listener throws an error. Um, this isn't super interesting, but let's, let's run it just, uh, just to make sure that we understand how this works. Okay. Right. And you get the stack trace, but the stack trace really isn't all that useful. You know, you, you really don't get the full story here. You, all, that you, all that you know is that, you know, at, at some point this function was called and, and it's, it's really difficult to reason about this. So let's, let's see what happens if we were to run this in what, what we call the long stack trace zone. I bet you guys can guess what the long stack trace zone does. But let's, let's see. So this is, this is really interesting. You can, you can get a full list of all of, the, all of these tasks that happen, right? So we see, we see throwing the error. Here, let's see if I can get both these on here at the same time. It's going to be a challenge. Right, so you can see where the error was thrown. But you can also see where this, this event listener was registered. And if you step back one more, you can see where the, the, the first event listener was added. And if you go all the way back, you can see that it was run right there. So like, think about this for a minute. Uh, what if you could get a stack trace like this? Oh, it gets better. It gets better, though. Right, what if, what if you could have a stack trace like this and have it logged to your server. You wouldn't have to ask users, how do I reproduce this? You actually can, can see the trail of which buttons they pressed. Right? You could actually build your test cases out of this sort of data. You, know, you could aggregate this. There's you know, all sorts of interesting possibilities from this. And again, all that I did was added this one line that says run it inside of this zone. And I was able to, to do this. So I think that this is really exciting. But this, this isn't the only demo. There's, there's more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, say, um, let's say you want to know about just some specific action in your application. So a user clicks a button, all these requests fire off to your server, all this UI update happens, and you really just want to know, uh, you know when, when is all of that stuff done? Um, you, might, you might encounter a, a scenario in like end-to-end -end testing, for instance, where there's not really a good way for you to figure out when something is done. Um, but if you know that you know, there's this many tasks queued up, and, uh, and the, 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 the uh, browser has this many things left to do, you can, you can automatically figure out, and you can avoid having to do ugly hacks like polling to figure out when, when the browser is done with some work. So let's, let's look at the code for this first. All right. There we go. I'm fighting with my window manager there. Um, so 
we have this, this counting zone. The implementation isn't super interesting. What we're going to do is we're going to run this main method when someone clicks, running it inside of this counting zone. Um, this is going to reset a counter on the zone, and then it's going to call this uh, asynchronous recursive function that just spawns more of itself over some time, and then it slowly decays. Um, and then also, this, in, in a real application, you'd, you'd have other things going on as well. You might be you know, caching some data, you might be uh, you know, updating something, you might, you might have uh, some sort of like local storage that you're persisting every so often. So we want to avoid profiling or, or thinking about these other things that are happening and just focus in on this main method. So one of the really interesting things about zones is that you, they're, they're very targeted, right? So they're only going to affect the things inside of where they're run. So doing this, we can, we can actually, we can actually uh, run this, right? So we have nine, goes around for a while, and then we're able to figure out that this is done. All of this complicated asynchronous uh, things happened, and without having to explicitly say, uh, you know, we're at the end, here's this callback that says we finished, we're able to just infer it from the, the number of asynchronous tasks that are in this queue. And that's really cool. So now we can actually, we could time this. We could say, how long does it take for my application to finish this particular course of action? Um, and notice, notice that I'm doing all of this with native browser APIs. Because of that, all of this is completely compatible with like any existing framework. So you can use this with with Angular, the current Angular, you could use it you know, with Backbone or jQuery. It, it doesn't really matter. Like, this isn't a weird proprietary buy-in. This actually patches the browser at a very low level and allows you to, to get these kind of insights, which is really cool. You just include this on your page, and all of a sudden, you have all these amazing superpowers. It's awesome. All right, so I have, I have one more demo then. Uh, about profiling, and this one, I actually, I want to, I want to show more of the the code around the zones. So this is actually this this might look familiar to you if I can find where it is. Well, let's let's talk about the demo first. So we let's let's say we just want to know about the CPU cost of some action, just like uh, the the original problem that I posed at the beginning of this. Um, so for this demo, we're going to sort uh, an array using my favorite silly sorting algorithm called uh, Bago sort. And the, the way that this works is uh, first you check if the array is sorted. If it is, you're done. If it isn't, you randomize the array. And then you recur. <laughs> and uh, because JavaScript, we're going to make this asynchronous. Right? So here's the implementation. It's pretty cool. Yeah, you sort by mathrandom minus 0.5. Um, and then you're checking here, and you eventually call back. And it's asynchronous because JavaScript. Um, so we're we're going to we're going to sort this and print it, but we're also going to be able to figure out um, how much CPU time the whole, this whole thing is taking, despite the fact that it's asynchronous and, and happening over a bunch of different tasks. So we can start profiling, and there it is. You can actually you can actually get a hold of this. And again, there's nothing there's nothing in this code that that does any of the timing, we're able to move all of that to the zone. And so let's take a look at this, at this profiling zone. I think, can you guys still see this all right if I zoom it out a bit? All right, so we have a timer function that uses uh, the, the high resolution timer if it's available, otherwise it does date.now. It's not super interesting. We have our on zone enter, which just starts the timer. The leave, which increments the total time by the current time minus when, when this particular task started. Uh, and then we have you know, some getter setters that reset the timer and also format it nicely. Like that's all we had to do in, a, in order to be able to uh, you know, profile any part of our app. I mean, you really have uh, just a, a crazy amount of, uh, of, of different granularities that you could use this at. You could say, I, I care about this, you know, this specific button, this specific event, you know, this specific HTTP request. So this gives you insight into a whole world of interesting things that otherwise uh, you would have had to hand code a bunch of timers in places, and now you don't, and that's pretty cool, I think. Um, let's see. I think I'm back in presentation land. All right. So, what does this have to do with Angular? Why are you presenting this at ng-conf? Like, uh, let's let's just say hypothetically you're working on a JavaScript framework, right? Maybe something like like Backbone or Ember. What's cool these days? Um, you're working on something like this, and you want to know 
when you need to update your view. And you want to do it in a way that's, that's transparent and that doesn't require someone that's using it to kind of you know, manually fire off all of these things that say, you know, update the view, render, or you know, maybe perform a digest cycle, or you know, something like that. So in, in Angular, can we figure out the right time to call root scope dot apply so that way you never ever have to think about it? So that way you can just rip this out of all your code. Like, can we do that? Like, yeah, we totally can. It actually just looks it'll look something like this. Angular doesn't have a you know an Angular dot digest, but so you can see how uh, if if you're making some HTTP request, if you run it in an, in an Angular zone that says Aha, this request finished, uh, you know, this task is over, now I can actually do my digest. You could see how this, this would be really powerful, right? And so we will use this as, as a fallback uh, alongside dirty checking in 2.0, so that way you just, you just don't have to worry about it. Like this just totally goes away, like that, it's gone. Um, so it's on GitHub, I tweeted about it, there's also the link. It's like 200 lines of code, and it's completely, it's completely distinct from Angular. So you can actually tell your backbone and number friends without getting into like a bitter framework argument thing. You can just be like, look at this cool thing this guy made. It has nothing to do with Angular. So that's pretty much all I got. Thank you.